I've never felt that the police were part of the process of justice. Okay, right, and he came, yeah, what about my sister? What about my brother yesterday? The evidence that's gotten from somebody from beating him up is not reliable. Clearly the intent at that point has to be to terrify. I've never seen such a quick, strong example of political action at work. But basically we were told if we would not publicly come there and protest, we would get the hearings we want. So all the work that had been done beforehand, the petitioning, the lobbying, the public information, had it not been for the public disruption, the threat of confrontation, those hearings would never have happened. Alderman Burke reluctantly granted us hearings. He did it on uh, Christmas Eve, I think, thinking that nobody would come. It sort of backfired since it was a slow news night. Uh, we put on evidence, Flint Taylor testified, Kirshner testified, and it made the media. Andrew Wilson was electronically shocked and burned. Tortured or beat blacks and Hispanics. We want something done. Directly involved in 14 instances of torture. One picture shows marks on earlobes. We don't have any authority here to do that. An electric charge up to 100 volts. Incredibly barbaric. Shortly after the city council hearings, Amnesty International, an international human rights organization, publicly released a report calling the world's attention to allegations of torture by Chicago police officers. The task force felt that that was critical, uh, that that made it uh, much more of a public issue. So we held a press conference in which we talked about that report, showed the black box, and I think uh, that did get a great deal of publicity, and I think that generally legitimatized the campaign that there was substantial evidence of torture by Chicago police. We tried the OPS, we tried the police board, we tried the attorney general, we, we tried everybody we could get in Chicago. We had to go to London to Amnesty International, a human rights organization, to get this paid attention to. Very often, Amnesty has found that in order to justify the treatment of torture, governments tend to, to, to put a, a label on these individuals, which in effect means that they are the throwaways. They are the ones that a society can do without in order to protect its standard of living, its borders, its internal security, its external security, whatever the arguments are. We're interested in torture and uh, uh, atrocities of that kind in other countries, but people really don't believe it happens here. And when we were in Honduras and El Salvador, we met with community groups who were telling us about what, what happened, and I'd be saying, yeah, just like Chicago, you know. <laughs> And people looked at me as if I were nuts. But people of color, particularly in Chicago, I think understand automatically much more easily situations like South Africa and Guatemala, because here in Chicago, you walk the streets with terror. You don't have any concept of the police as a service, a serve and protect. Instead, your view of the police is a view that they're getting ready to trump you or to whip on you the minute they encounter you. I've come to believe that it is a form of genocide um, or, you know, suppression and repression of a whole community of minorities. It's not just the African-American community, it's a Latino community as well. And so for whites to start taking action, and this is part of moving the gears of getting a little more racial harmony in this city and in the United States in general, I think. On Saturday, April 27th, there will be another mass anti-racist march in Bridgeport to protest police lawlessness and racist violence there, and to protest the mayor's refusal to take action against police commander John Burge and his Chicago police torture squad. Thank you. We're going to Bridgeport because that's where the mayor is. 
And that's where the buck stops in this city around police brutality and, and basically everything else. Nobody has really confronted daily, you got to get rid of Burge. And we got to make this a political issue. If we can allow this police torture to be a commander in Chicago, if we can allow the 9th District, where these two cops who picked up these two kids, to hold a phony investigation and acquit the two cops, somebody's got to hold the police department accountable. When Amnesty came out with their report, Daly went on TV and said, there's no basis for these charges. There have been investigations. There's nothing here. So he has publicly defended Burge and taken up his cause. Our message is really how many people we get out there, how many people we show him care or concerned um, aren't going to tolerate it. And what we felt really worked was we took it upon ourselves to organize white people. And black people organized in the black community. I think the March in Bridgeport is very important because that's one of the ways we can show them that we're not going to tolerate this racism in Chicago and, um, and try to put an end to it. This right here is a big one. I know. Oh, oh, it's good. We really need the support, man. We're going to speak, we're going to march to the tavern, to the police station, and to Daly's house. Because right. it's his city and he's not doing nothing it's about it, you know what I'm saying? I think we're going to make a real positive statement with this rally. Especially if Calvin and, all, and the, another victim, Joe, you know, speak out and tell the people what's going on. sound of political struggle. Squeak, squeak, squeak. <laughs> here today is because we've gone to the police board, we've gone to city council, we've gone to um, police headquarters, um, we've gone to Office of Professional Standards, and nobody's done anything. So now here we are, and we had to come to Daly's house, we had to come to his neighborhood, because there's been a lot of racist violence in here, and nobody's done anything. Daly, the mayor, who's done nothing about it. At some point, it's going to be a political liability, and Burge is going to have to go. around John Burge and says it's okay. He says the allegations against Burge don't amount to anything. It's okay to torture young black men in the city of Chicago. The publicity and exposure around the city council hearings and the amnesty report and the demonstrations required OPS in order to maintain any credibility to reopen their investigation of John Burge in Area 2. OPS is the Office of Professional Standards and it's the body to which a person goes if they're the victims of police brutality. They take the complaint, they do an investigation, and if they find for the person making the complaint, they sustain it. 
They can then recommend disciplinary action, anything from suspension up to firing against the police officer. OPS, uh, when it was created in 1974, was supposedly to be a, a civilian independent investigative agency which uh, was supposed to deal with uh, police uh, ex use of excessive force. Uh, but it was put under the control of the police superintendent. Uh, many of the investigators turned out to be people who either worked previously for the police department or who were waiting to become police officers. Um, and it really never had any real independence. And actually not much ha happens with OPS anyhow. You know, there's such a small percentage of cases. Historically, it's been five or six percent of the cases that are uh, sustained at all where any discipline is given. The police have a brotherhood. And if one police officer does something uh, such as police brutality, his comrades support him. Uh, they support him not in saying, okay, rah, rah, you did this and that's great, but they support him in climbing up. They won't tell what really happened. Thus, unless it occurs with civilian witnesses who happen to see it, and there are no civilian witnesses in the police station or in a police car, the complaint will not be sustained. After a very detailed investigation, OPS made findings that John Burge had tortured Andrew Wilson and that Area 2 detectives, including John Burge, had systematically tortured black suspects over a period of 10 years. Superintendent Martin sat on the results of this investigation for a long time and only finally released the report, which resulted in Burge's being fired 16 months after it was received. I think Martin's role and knowledge in this should be specifically investigated uh, because it's impossible that he would not have known about it. If the evidence continued to grow and the political pressure grew, uh, then it was very difficult for the media to ignore it. And it was at that point that you saw some of the media really beginning to take a, a strong interest in this case. Tonight, a confidential report implicates a high-ranking Chicago police officer in the alleged torture of criminal suspects. But the full report still is held under wraps, held by police superintendent Leroy Martin. There is no cover-up. And, and, and let's just say, how can I cover it up? This thing isn't going away. Yet cover-up is exactly what some critics are now suggesting, because the superintendent has suddenly delayed the promised release of an investigation. But he says he has nothing to hide, and the report is coming. When can we see the Burge report? Soon. When? Soon. We hope that when and if, and we think it's going to be when, and we think it's going to be fairly soon, we hope that the sustained report from OPS comes down on Commander Burge, that the press doesn't just report that and let it go. We hope you are diligent and aggressive in following up why this was allowed to go on for the last 19 years. There will be no Pulitzer Prizes around this story in Chicago, let me tell you that right now. But they managed to report the entire Amnesty International report without ever once mentioning the name John Birch in the Chicago press. We had a joke in the task force. There was another complainant of police brutality who wanted to make a statement but didn't want their name used. And we said, just tell the press their name is Burge. They'll never use it. The current mayor, Richard Daly, of course, was the state's attorney in 1982 when the torture uh, happened to Andrew Wilson. And during that time, he did not investigate, and now he's in a position of uh, being the one who ultimately controls the political decision as to whether Burge is fired. And to date, it looks like, although he may have reluctantly okayed the individual prosecution of Burge in the Wilson case, that he is uh, ferociously defending his department and his police superintendent, soon to be departed, uh, Martin, 
uh, against the uh, findings of his own agency of systematic torture. I'll tell you one thing, Police Superintendent Martin is not for police brutality. If you're trying to portray that superintendents of police are for police brutality, you're greatly mistaken. And the police officers are not, and the people are not. In November of 1991, uh, Martin finally suspended Burge uh, pending the outcome of hearings before the police board. In February of 1992, there were lengthy hearings in which the evidence of Burge's torture of Wilson and a couple of other victims was presented. The task force, along with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, had a demonstration in front of the police headquarters um, on the day that the uh, hearings were scheduled to open. If it wasn't for all of the, us demonstrating for the last two years, there would, the OPS would never have sustained this complaint, and there would never be dismissal proceedings beginning against John Burns. It's and we wanted to say, yes, we're glad that you're finally having hearings, and it's because of our actions um, and the actions of the lawyers on the case and the actions of Amnesty International and Citizens Alert who've brought this to your attention, but we're not going to keep silent. We are going to still keep pushing you and make sure that you go through with this and not make it a sham hearing as they have done for so long in this matter. I don't know if it was naive of, of members of the task force, but unfortunately, we had this idea that once this evidence, overwhelming as it is, um, came out, we thought that uh, all we had to do was reveal the truth and people would come around and, and change their mind about Burge. And, um, and unfortunately, that's not what happened. Quite the contrary. They find that there's a sustained finding of torture against a man, and what happens? About two to 3,000 white police officers come out and celebrate it. And um, we thought this was an outrage, a moral outrage, and we decided to hold a counter demonstration. Rather than coming out and finally saying, uh-oh, we've got to change our policy, rather than the city taking that kind of position or the Fraternal Order of Police, no, they rallied, rallied for him and in support of him and in support, we think, to continue those kinds of racist policies. Police and police supporters across the country have rallied to the defense of Burge a decorated police officer and Vietnam veteran. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of taxpayers' money, and it's an insult to the law enforcement. And what they're doing is trying to neutralize good law enforcement in the city of Chicago. Burge declined our attempts to interview him about his case. At a fundraiser for him earlier this year, he only lamented the process. It's only 10 years. Started uh, February the 9th, 1982. Hopefully it'll be over with soon. It's now December 1992, nine months after the hearings were completed and we have no decision by the police board. One of the reasons we think they've been delaying is in April of 92, the Rodney King verdict came out and there were riots in Los Angeles. We think the police board doesn't want to have a similar response if they reinstate John Burge in Chicago. I think that that's, there's a very good chance that if they fire Burge, they can say, see, the system works. But if they really think that the system works, they're going to have to do a lot of other firing because Burge is an example. I mean, he's a horrible example, but he's really just the tip of the iceberg. If he goes unpunished, it is it's sending a, a message of a green light to other police officers. They can commit police brutality of any type, uh, and then they're not going to be disciplined for it. Burge goes into court smiling and cocky. He's been doing this stuff for 20 years. 
this. And he keeps getting away with it because nobody holds him accountable. The public has got to be outraged. I think it's important for the community to organize, to educate, to agitate, to do things like get John Burgess off the force. But I, I don't think that that's the end all. I don't think that that's the answer. I don't think that's the panacea. I don't think because we don't have John Burgess on the police force, we have liberation. I don't think we can separate police brutality from general oppression. In unity, there's strength. And in the masses, there's power. And as long as you, what they want to do is divide and, and conquer. And as long as they keep people divided, they have a better chance of picking them off one by one by one. But if they mass together, then they have the force and the strength and they have a louder voice and they can combat these uh, atrocities a lot better. that we made it clear we were going to be there publicly confronting officials until something happened around Burge. We were going to keep it in their face. We were going to embarrass them with it. We weren't going to back off. And I think that militancy uh, is the specific and the really important contribution the task force has made to this. So we have a moral obligation to the community to keep this issue in the forefront of the minds of people because it is certainly more than possible that it will occur again.